Hare Krishna, Gurudev Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Thank Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Always happy to be here with you, Chaitanya Charanji. So it's one of the highlights of my month to be with you. I would say one of the top highlights. And it's such a joy to interact in many different uh, topics and in many fresh, as well as you could say, you know, I thought of freshly traditional perspectives. So, uh. <laughs> so you know, I had thought of a topic of grieving, but since you suggested a beautiful title, love and loss in relationships with, uh, with living and uh, departed Vaishnavas. So I'll just give a bit con context and then uh, we can take the discussion further. Recently, I had a podcast with uh, Rajivihari Prabhu and he mentioned something quite scary. He said that uh, probably the next decade could well be a decade of tears for ISKCON because many of the prominent leaders of our movement will be leaving. They are already quite advanced in their age. So of course, separation from devotees is also very, uh, it's heart-wrenching. At the same time, it is also inspiring to see how they leave their bodies gracefully. But uh, it also has a lot of uh, personal emotional trauma, as well as we could say social or institutional ramifications, which need to be dealt with. So in that context, uh, we, in, even in this COVID times, we have had uh, these two senior leaders, Bhakti Charu Maharaj and Puka Jangari Prabhu departing, and of course, many others also. So how, how do, and loss can come in many different ways. It's not just uh, the loss in terms of departure. Loss can come in terms of, we lose relationship because of misunderstanding and conflicts. We can lose relationships because of sometimes uh, questionable behavioral, behavioral lapses, moral lapses in someone who we respect or care for. It could be both ways, you know, a subordinate losing an authority figure or an authority figure losing a, a, losing a beloved subordinate. So, so in general, uh, you know, how do we deal with this loss? Because sometimes some devotees go to the attitude that you know, that better focus only on our relationship with Krishna and I will just practice my bhakti and not get better. I don't know whom I can trust, whom I can connect with. But then that also makes us quite lonely. And and sharing our heart and connecting with devotees is an important limb of bhakti. So that was the broad background. Because if you had some other points in mind also, we could discuss that. But this is where I am coming from in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think it's important to start uh, Jaitanya Charanji with the a priori assumption, the beginning point, that all relationships that we have here in this world are to teach us how to love. This is so beautiful. It, All relationships. Yeah. As, as imperfectly as we may pursue them, or perfectly, or anything in between, they're meant to teach us about pure love. Now, the bhakta especially understands this. Because we are a tradition of the heart. We are a tradition that focuses on the purification of the heart. And that purification may take place between you and me. Because we, you and I have a relationship. Hmm. And you have other relationships. And I have other relationships. In our kshetras, our extended kshetras, right? Our persons in relation to other persons, we have a sphere of interactions with other persons. 
Mm. And it's in those relationships within that sphere that we are either exercising our pure loving hearts or not. Now, beautiful. So what you're saying is that I love the way you connected the two points. First is that uh, we are relationships meant to teach us how to love. And in order to, if you want to love Krishna or pure our, purify ourselves, it is how do we express that love and make it purer? It is through the relationships, through the interactions. Because otherwise, love is just an abstract conception unless yes. it is expressed. And where are we going to express it? It is, it, it, you know, it's it's ultimately we want to express in relationship with Krishna, but realistically, right now we have to express it in our interactions with the devotees around us. Yes, but don't don't separate those two. Okay, a good point. Yeah. See, Chaitanya Charanji, there is the embodiment of Chaitanya Charan. Okay. So I'm in a human form. And Chaitanya Charanji, he is in a human form. And so we interact on the basis of our situations here in this world. And Chaitanya Charanji, as an embodied being, is a unique, you know, individual. That's my own word. I don't like the word individual because that sounds like you're caught in the individual. You know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we are portions of the undivided absolute as chapter 13 in the Bhagavad Gita explains. We are little individuals, infinitesimal individuals related and part of the unlimited undivided supreme that undivided supreme appears as individuals of his non-individual self in each of us so in chaitanya charan there is a, an embodied being but there's also uh, the instrumentality factor Chaitanya Charan's a being unto himself as a individual of the undivided absolute, but he's also uh, uh, someone through whom Krishna speaks. He is an instrument. Krishna is present in his heart. So this is, you know, extraordinary. This is Sarvasya Chaham Hridhi Sanvishtaha, right? You know, he has entered fully Samnavishta, entered deep, ni, okay, entered deep and deeply and completely into Chaitanya Charan's heart. So when I'm speaking to you, the you is dual. I'm speaking to you, Chaitanya Charanji but I know Krishna is also, he's also listening. Beautiful. Yeah, first of all, I love this. It's not just a play of word, but it's a very striking uh, point of individual. And the individual is both an individual or a, as a person in their own right, but also an instrument for the Supreme Person. That's right. Yeah. And yes. A individual, a individual in and of itself, but also a a um, uh, a, a kind of how would you say a uh, what would be a good word for that? An extension, an extension of the divine. There are no sparks without a fire. So true. You know, just yesterday, I just completed a seminar on grief. 
three part seminar on growing through grief and is talking about how we may we may have two extreme attitudes toward relationships so if if you can permit me i'll just share a powerpoint slide which i had made which i think yes. reflects this point so you know holistic attitude toward relationships so one extreme is where we treat human relationships as ultimately fulfilling you know that's that's the romance novels and romance movies yeah. where we find the perfect person and then we are happily ever after right so that is one extreme but the other extreme is to treat all relationships as ultimately meaningless where yes. we just become dismissive but the more balanced attitude is actually what you were saying that human relationships and i i just put it as pointers to the divine relationship but the way you put it is beautiful all relationships are meant to teach us how to love purely so yes so we could say to some extent that within the within the materialistic society somehow i don't have a better word i sometimes don't like that word materialistic society but this is we we often go toward this extreme but sometimes in the devotee community we go toward the other extreme yes of, you know treating our relationships as ultimately meaningless so there's i allowed the way you talked about both you to see the person as a individual and see them also as a channel through which may krishna is expressing his love for us krishna is speaking to us and also krishna is receiving our love krishna is receiving our service also yes so both ways yes beautiful i like that chart yes mm-hmm. our love for one another cannot be possible without krishna's ultimate love and this applies even if there is no krishna in the relationship at all in consciousness that's right that's right the advantage the bhakta has is that he or she knows that krishna is involved and that makes it all the more delightful that makes it really you know tojanticha romanticha you know that makes it just so fulfilling beautiful but all love all true love actually nourishes and grows the heart in each of the individuals so if you were suddenly to leave this world chaitanya charanji krishna forbid but i I'd, i'd like to have you still around chaitanya charanji you know so but let's just say suddenly you should disappear are you dead to me no no you have made contributions to my heart i will always carry a bit of chaitanya charan right here in my heart and hopefully i with yours now i can't say that that's the case you would have to say that but the idea is that if love is love we receive affection and we give it and that's a part of us so even when a vaishnava may depart from this world they cannot completely depart it's interesting the word depart well first of all it means that their part their individual is displaced but the effects of that individual on other individuals is permanent if it's pure love because the love coming from one individual to another is is something that nourishes ultimately the spiritual body especially you know when we're talking about bhaktas here we're talking about growing a spiritual body which is the ultimate individuality not individuality individuality a little individual in the whole context of divine leela so we are individuals with one another 
seeking the undivided supreme reality. And when you and I get together, we have what is de defined in the Bhagavad Gita between Arjuna and Krishna. We have um, dharmyam samvadam, sacred conversation. And through that kata, katiyantascha mam nityam. Hmm. I mean, you and I have a hard time stop talking. I mean, that's a, True. That, that's a hard, that, we, we have to discipline ourselves with the clock. But but katiyantascha mam nityam, constantly sharing in conversation. Then there's the romanticha, tojanticha romanticha. So, there's something that is indelibly etched in our hearts from the pure love coming from other Vaishnavas. Now, the loss of the loss of living Vaishnavas, where relationships break, where there are broken connections between Vaishnavas. Well, the reason they were together at one point in the first place was because of affection. Yes. So even if it breaks, there is still something that they have been nourished by. Mm, beautiful. So if I may just interrupt you, or you want to complete the yes. thought? No, you, you can, yeah, react, uh, please. There are two uh, okay, thank you. I think react is a better word than interrupt. <laughs> it's um... even you don't really react; you respond. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> that is that. even better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, <clears throat> I allowed this the way you phrased it that our interactions, especially if they are pure, they nourish our spiritual body. So let's start with the first point, and we'll move forward. So you said no love would be possible without Krishna be between two people, even if they are not aware. So are you referring there to the point that, you know, like Krishna says in 1041 in the Gita that everything opulent manifests a spark of my splendor. So whatever it is that two people find lovable in each other, that is a spark of Krishna in them. And in that sense, without that, without the two people seeing some kind of spark of Krishna, there would not be any any love possible? Or is it something else that you are saying that, that no love would be possible without Krishna between two people? Because in one sense, many times, what people call as love, it may often take them away from God because of yes. infatuation or whatever else. But yes. even within that, you know, if a person is attracted to somebody's beauty, and that beauty is also a spark of Krishna's supreme beauty. Yes. So, is that what you are referring to broadly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have the right idea. I mean, I mean, worldly love, um, love that is tainted by some selfish need or for some uh, conditions, as Krishna describes three kinds of love, or our three different relationships to love itself. He explains in the penultimate chapter of the Rasa Panchadhyayi. He explains there are some the, who love uh, because they desire to have love reciprocated. There are others, and that's worldly love. If you love me, then I'll love you. Um, now, it's not that that can be utterly impure, but that there is a sense in which it is more um, uh, uh, fulfilling some kind of selfish need. And so there's love, you know, mixed with, with, with lust. Um, uh, some kind of, what is lust? Lust is the, this kind of need to have yourself pleased rather than to please another. Where does that all begin? Where does where did, what is the root of lust? It is the ahankara. I am making myself 
<laughs> literally i am making okay oh i never thought that's what ahankara means huh? that's what it means aham kara i'm busy making myself you're there chaitanya charan only because i'm busy making myself you're you are um uh, useful to me uh because uh i need to make myself so i'm going to use you that's a hankara so mm -hmm. i made up a word i made up a word to be the, an the antonym and the antidote of a hankara anyakara anyakara you mentioned that earlier right that's right so uh, rather to be centered upon another instead of myself, right? So real, the, the purer the love, the more purely we can center ourselves on the thoughts and feelings of another and serve them. Now, if we are a bhakta, if we're bhaktas, we are aware that Krishna is in their hearts. So we're serving Krishna through their hearts as well as serving them in their hearts. Sarvasya chaham, right? It's a khridhi in the heart. You know, Krishna's there. So worship of Krishna, bhaktas, find out when they move from the Kanishta level, they realize that actually I can serve Krishna in whomever I meet. Beautiful. The body is a walking, talking temple of Krishna. That's the 13 markings of the, of the body. And uh, there's a temple. So when you meet another person, you're effectively going to the temple. You're meeting the pujari, that's this jivatma, and you're observing how that jivatma is connected to the paramatma. Now, in a devotee body, in a devotee being, they're loving Krishna. So there, this temple is very active. In worldly persons, it's almost as if the temple has been closed down. <laughs> you know, it's, you're trying to. It's almost like a, a condemned building. You know, uh, you're you're you're, yeah, you're trying like to a, you're trying to revive. You know, the condemned building. You know, it's like a deserted or even a desecrated temple. <laughs> yes, yeah. something, something like that. That's right. That's a beautiful metaphor and uh, in the third canto i think kapila says this that that it the yogis see the lord see the lord not only in the deity form but they see the lord in the hearts of everyone there you so, go so and that is a more advanced stage of yoga but the yes, way, it is. but the way you phrased it is beautiful so that is when we meet anyone actually we are going to a temple we're and, going to a temple and we're supposed to worship at the altar of their hearts. So when we when it is said that pure devotees are like Tirthi Kurvanti Tirthani, they are moving places of pilgrimage. So that is there like an go. active temple where the sanctity is very visible for us. That's right. But the other places are where where we actually may have to uncover the sanctity. That's so, right. But all everybody is. Uh, is uh, connected with Krishna. I think this is not just beyond Kanishta. This would be almost like a Uttama level, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. You meet a worldly person. This is a chance for us to build a temple. When you meet a bhakta, this is a chance to attend the temple. So when we talk about spreading the movement, it's already spread. So it's almost like we Prabhupada said that there are devotees and there are temples, they're just going to manifest. It's just time is separating us. So we could say that is also a reality for every soul. Because every soul is ultimately will be delivered by Krishna's love. Yes. So maybe we can we can accelerate their journey in some small way. 
Exactly. You know, Prabhupada used to always quote that phrase from the Vedanta Sutra, Ananda Mayo Vyasat. Hmm. That there is something fundamentally, ontologically embedded in the nature of things, of being, of existence. It's ultimately a loving place. The bhakta is the one that brings that out. The bhakta exemplifies that loving place. The bhakta manifests that loving place. The bhakta celebrates with others that loving place. That's our job. That's what we do. It doesn't matter who, you know, Chaitanya Charanji, I, you know, go to the grocery store. Hmm. I never take anyone for granted there. I look at everyone moving around. Oh my gosh, look at all of these, you know, condemned temples or, or all of these somewhat open temples, you know, they're all moving around. It drives me crazy. You know, and then when I finally am at the register, cash register, and the young man or young lady is helping me, right? And I look over at them, and I see their name tag. I say, good afternoon, Emily. She says, oh, good afternoon. And I try to connect with her or him in a way that is that delivers something special. I I can't even describe it particularly. I may even say something funny, like, you must see a lot of crazy people come through here every day, right? And she, and invariably she'll laugh, right? She says, yeah. I, and I say, I'm going to try not to be one of those for you, okay? <laughs> now, they don't normally have people connecting with them. You know, it's sort of, you know, the little, you know, beep, beep, you know, the, the electronic, you know, reader of the barcodes, you know, beep, beep, you know how many beep, beeps they hear all day long? They're a sort of an extension of a machine. That can beep, 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 bagging the groceries. Beep, beep, bagging the groceries. Beep, 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 bagging. This is a very mechanical, you know, way to make money. They're doing it because that they need to. That's fine. But I want to bring them out of that and connect with something a little, a little joyful a little friendly, a little loving. And I do it every time. If there is a, a temple that's inactive, an inactive temple in front of me, I will seek to build up the temple a little bit at that very moment. That spontaneous building of a temple, spreading the movement, the movement of what? What are we moving? Chichen Charan, we're moving hearts. That's what movement means. Beautiful. What otherwise, what else are we moving? You tell me. I've been doing this for 50 years. It's the movement of the heart. That's what we're moving. You move my heart, Chaitanya Jaranji. I find you to be a very affectionate and realized soul. That moves my heart. Otherwise, I wouldn't waste my time. Well, I can say today at least, my heart is moving so fast that I'm losing track. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm still. Uh, what? How should I put it? I'm still trying to process that vision of what you said about a grocery store. Yeah. 
I remember His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj. I was one time in Pune Temple. He was in the guest reception department. So I had heard a talk by Maharaj. He said that she treat every person who comes to the temple as a personal guest of their lordships, and that was a very remarkable conception. Yes. And uh, recently, I was talking with one devotee who is pioneer, who is who was a pioneer in online outreach. and he told me something which i had never thought of that he said that every person who visits your website now you should treat them like the website is the manifestation of krishna they are coming to so treat them like a guest who is coming to a temple mm, yes. i never i never thought of a website visitor like that because often we treat it in terms of statistics and number of views and things like that but you know that is the manifestation of krishna that is attracting them so it's it's a beautiful image to actually contemplate Yes. Mm-hmm. Just uh, developing this thought. So, if uh, we could have that much of a devotional vision with uh, with those who, whose temples are not active, then we can, we need to have a far more far more of that vision with uh, those who ste- who are active temples in a sense. Yes. So, if I may just now, I was considering why this doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. there could be many reasons but i thought of three reasons one is because we have too many things to do even in bhakti we have projects to achieve and uh, deadlines to meet and uh, some things like that another is that we have um, different opinions about uh, practical things as well as philosophical things and third is that uh, no we we often don't think that as a sufficiently important part of bhakti so we think that okay as it's like we take vows for uh, chanting a particular number of rounds but we don't and we take vows for avoiding certain uh, anti devotional activities but we don't really take any vow for spending time with devotees so sometimes it it gets undermined just by the fact that we are that we think as yes, this is something which I I know it's important but I can do it later also. So yes. as one of my devotee friends he said that uh, if if I had started this monks podcast 20 years ago the only thing I would have got is uh, chastisement. You know why are you wasting your time and others time do something productive. <laughs> <laughs> so in many ways I can say that our movement has evolved. Yeah uh, and but So these are what I thought are the obstacles to this happening, but what are your thoughts about this? I think that um, what you're saying is 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 really true. I think that there is, you know, this time is the right time for Chaitanya Charan's podcast. The kinds of things that you discuss with devotees, the way you are probing, um, um, your you want devotees to ponder deeply and carefully and affectionately the great gifts that prabhupada has given us and the way each of us is attempting to process them and i think this is really uh, you know a wonderful seva i i really do and um it's it's not going to be for everybody not everyone is able and willing to ponder these things deeply but for those who are what a gift you're you're offering here uh, chaitanya charanji so to invite uh, so many wonderful vaishnavas uh, to share what is so deeply moving in their hearts it's what it's that's what the movement is about the movement of the heart toward other hearts but you know if we go back to the bhagavad gita and we look at what it means when our hearts are moving freely and um without obstruction when our hearts have been relieved of a lot of the pain and hurt and trauma of the past when our hearts have been lifted up by krishna's love and the devotee's love mm. then then this is wonderful but 
What happens when we have a shattered heart? The phrase is shattered heart in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna experienced a shattered heart. What was it that was painful for Arjuna? What I call the Arjuna syndrome is something that invariably all of us will have in this life. Arjuna was, um, uh, he asked Krishna to move the chariot in between both the armies. Mm. And Arjuna did not realize what he would experience. But he realized that on the opposing side of the battlefield, on the side of the Kauravas, were relatives, friends, and even his guru. People for whom he had reverence, people for whom he had a great deal of affection and love, but people who had another side that was representing and promoting evil. This is what shattered Arjuna's heart. This is what caused him grief. Shoka. Shoka. You know, Chaitanya Charan, we experience persons that persons have many sides to them. Uh, you know, sometimes we discover the side of a person that has done bad things, even criminal things, even evil things. And this is very painful. This is very painful. It's not about forgiveness. I know this is a catch-all word all over the place. It's really not about forgiveness. It's about being real about what's in front of you. Now, Arjuna could have said to Krishna, oh, oh, wait a minute. All my friends and relatives are over there. Drive me over to the other side. I want to fight with them. I, I want to join the evil side because, frankly, those are my friends. So, you know what? I'll join them. No. Then, then he's not being true to his heart. Then he's being repressive. Or he could have said, I hate all those people fighting for Dhritarashtra. I hate them. I don't even care who they are. I hate them all. And I'm going to kill them. Don't even take me into the middle of the battlefield. I don't even want to see who's there. I'm going to kill them. That's the other extreme. Arjuna had the heart of a bhakta. He wanted to be real. And the reality of the situation, Chaitanya Charanji, was he was to kill in battle those whom he loved. And the, first, the second half of the first chapter, 18 and a half verses were spoken by Arjuna to Krishna dumping the contents of his shattered heart onto Krishna. Krishna said nothing. He listened. And that is exactly what Krishna wants to do. He wants to hear our hurt. He wants us to share our pain with him. He wants us to dump the contents of our shattered hearts onto him. Because then we will all do what Arjuna did. We will completely give ourselves even more to Krishna, and Krishna will reveal himself even more to us. Cool. Chaitanya Charanji, without Arjuna's shattered heart, we would not have the Dharmyang Samvadam, the great conversation between Arjuna and Krishna. That shattered heart produced the Bhagavad Gita. You know, Prabhu, this is, I studied the Bhagavad Gita, and of course, you have studied deeply, but it's delightful to see something. Uh, 
so profoundly i would put it profoundly practical yes come alive it comes yeah, alive it comes alive so right. i was thinking of two things i will one yeah. is that you know arjuna chose voluntarily to come into the middle of the battlefield and then he saw things very differently from what he would have seen from one side that's right he so, didn't so have some... to come he did not have to come to the middle of the battlefield yeah. that was his yeah. choice it wasn't krishna saying hey arjuna i think you better see what's going on here he didn't it didn't say that yeah so sometimes you know we do that ourselves sometimes uh, we are forced by situations to do that means we are just going about our functional way of living and then suddenly sometimes we see see that those those whom we loved as you said they sometimes have a dark side which can be disturbing so it seems that sometimes uh, like situationally we are forced to confront it like suppose we are in a administ in a position where we have to as you said dispense justice not just forgive forgiveness or sometimes right. it just comes upon us as gossip so i would say oh, this person did this and this person did that so it's like if it's coming as if we are getting into gossip we could say it like arjuna choosing to go in between the two armies but sometimes right. we are forced by our duty or by situation to go in between the two armies isn't it so we are forced to see the dark side of those whom we care for also and then yeah but you know what chaitanya charji i would say that it's not like i would like to use the example set by arjuna is not that we are forced you see it was Arjuna's idea to get real on the battlefield. You see, sometimes I'm too much of a coward to actually go in the middle of the dualistic situation in which I find myself. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? Arjuna chose to do this. This is to his credit. Chaitanya Charanji most of us say i don't want to go in the middle of the battlefield i i don't i don't even want to see what's going on on the other side i don't want to be sensitive to the situation in front of me i am scared to go into the middle of the battle hey, did you notice no one else went into the middle of the battlefield everyone preferred to stay in their dualistically alienated situation you are you know pro mask i'm anti mask or you know some silly you know you know this this these dualisms these dual dualities that krishna speaks about endless dualities in this world and what does duality mean it means alienation one side alienated from the other and tension kali you know beautiful so prabhu yeah, this is also the way i have heard this first chapter explained is that uh, arjuna is wanting to go in the middle was yes. his willfulness yes his bravery it's, yeah it's bravery but i mean it of no but wait, sometimes explained as his, it was a mistake it was unnecessary he could if he had not gone there he wouldn't have become bewildered but <laughs> that's not the only way of looking at it right it because he went there he saw the complexity of the situation Yes and that's how the wisdom of the bhagavad gita became necessary for him. Yes and I give him credit for that. Mm. I give him credit for being able to sit with his grief and not to try to cover it up. Chaitanya Charanji this movement suffered greatly by not really going through a period of grieving Prabhupada's departure. you will have to unpack that how would how would what would grieving have meant and uh, how would it have helped i mean in one sense uh, devotees have now started writing a lot of memory memories of prabhupad and started re- relishing his presence that or relishing his past times that way is that what you are referring to or is it more about you know how to actually carry on his mission and to live on in his absence what do you mean exactly 
what we did in the movement is we moved too fast and not with our hearts. That was the movement that occurred. We moved way too fast and we moved away from our hearts. It's as if Arjuna went into the middle of the battlefield and said, hmm, um, I'm just going to join the other side. I'm not going to look at the grief that's welling up in my heart. I'm going to ignore that. And I'm just going to join the other side. I'm going to focus on the institution. I'm going to focus on becoming powerful. But in weakness, we find strength from Krishna. In strength that's falsely taken up, we become truly weak. Arjuna became strong because he brought his broken heart, his shattered heart to Krishna. And he took the time to process that grief. Oh, okay. So what you are trying to say is that in one sense, uh, bhakti is actually about inward development of connection with Krishna, but after and with of course Prabhupada, but after Prabhupada's departure, we continued on aggressively with the externals of bhakti. Like say Correct. building temples, distributing books, imitating even, Prabhupada. Yeah. And in that sense, we made the material markers of success as our definitions of success in bhakti also. So in that sense, we unwittingly joined the opposite side. Is that what you're trying to say? That's right. We lost our hearts. By realizing that our hearts were shattered, we could regain our hearts in deep connection to Krishna's divine heart. By ignoring the shattered heart, our hearts become uh, flattened and uh, we become heartless. You know, the great lesson, one of the great lessons about grief is there in that beautiful, beautiful prologue of the Ramayana. And please, everyone listening to this, please don't say Ramayan. Please say Ramayana. Please. That is the correct pronunciation. Now, in the beginning of the Ramayana, there's a prologue of how Valmiki's Ramayana was written. So one day, Valmiki was performing his ablutions in the Tamasa River. And very beautiful day. And he noticed, you know the story, you noticed the crane, these two loving cranes on a branch high up in a tree. And a hunter came along, drew his bow, and released his arrow into the heart, through the heart of the male crane, who, whose body dropped to the ground. The female crane alighted uh, uh, to the ground and was just in absolute grieving. Uh, 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 hysterics. Valmiki watched this senseless, senseless act of violence on these loving cranes. Cranes are known to be particularly loving birds, by the way. Valmiki was furious. He was angry. He was hurt by the crane's hurt. And he cursed the hunter to never uh, uh, 
find um, a home all the days of his life. He would never find uh, himself at a home all the days of his life, something like that. And I always wondered, you know, Chaitanya Charan, why that curse? He killed something, maybe he should be killed. Or something like that. You know, why what where did that curse come from? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But Valmiki's curse was spoken in a certain um meter in Sanskrit, where his shoka turned into shloka, his grief turned into poetry. Hmm. He recognized, he didn't turn and say, oh, there goes a hunter and I'm not gonna, I'm, you know, this is not, not something I wanna be involved with. He didn't do that. He, he felt deeply about this. He felt the grief, uh, he empathically felt the grief of the female crane. Well, I realized why the hunter cursed what he cursed. I mean, I'm sorry. Valmiki cursed the hunter with the curse that he, he gave. It's because he was not punishing the hunter in terms of the dead, but he was punishing the hunter in terms of the suffering that the living would experience. Because never again would that female crane ever be able to land on a branch without looking over her shoulder. She was traumatized. For her, a branch meant a place of loving. Now, she could never find a home in nature because of that hunter. Valmiki said, now you, hunter, will never find a home all the days of your life. You will wander without a home, just like you did to that crane. Symbolic, of course, of Ram Lila and Sita's position. So grief, shoka. So we devotees, Chaitanya Charanji, need to figure out how to turn shoka into shloka, grief into poetry, shattered heart into a full heart as Arjuna did with Krishna. Beautiful. Oh, I've read the Ramayana so many times. Uh, this aspect, of course, that from Shloka came Shoka. So from Shoka came Shloka, that is quite a well-known yes. phrase of play of, I mean, phrasing, phrasing of the situation. Right. But the way you analyze it is beautiful. So... What you are but, saying but, by that but, is but Chaitanya Charan. Yeah. Look what look what Arjuna did. His shoka brought out so much divine shloka from Krishna. Hmm. So just going back, you're saying that yeah. uh, I mean I was completing this Ramayan point. Mm -hmm. so when you said that uh, it it foreshadows what happens to Sita is that means uh, she experiences the grief of being separated from Ram. And uh, she doesn't have a loser. She loses her home. Is that what you're saying, or what? Uh, what? Ex how? How is it foreshadowing exactly? So we're talking about loss, love, yes. and loss, right? So that's really sort of our theme today: yes. love and loss. So here, the royal marriage. There was so much love between Sita and Ram. Sita was <clears throat> coaxed to leave her circle of protection and to ultimately be disconnected from Ram. Ram sought her out with the help of Hanumanji. You know, she was saved. She was brought back. But was she really ever? No. You see, Ravana 
is the consummate terrorist. Consummate. He's what every terrorist wants to do. A terrorist doesn't mind dying. You see, we, we celebrate the death of Ravana every year. And that's the defeat of evil, goodness over evil. But you know what? In my opinion, Ravana won. Ravana broke the royal marriage forever. Sita had to disappear and go away. Nothing would ever return. Just like the crane would never have a home. The royal marriage would never be the same. Now, this is, of course, a beautiful viraha kind of, you know, uh, 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 right? It's a beautiful kind of, you know, uh, but but because these leelas are eternal, of course, Sita and Ram's the royal connection and their royal love for one another, that's always eternal too. And that's why we go to the temple and we see Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman together in their loving relationship. But eternally also is the eternal broken, the brokenness of their love. And that, Chaitanya Charanji, is exactly what terrorists want to do. They, they don't care about dying. They want their evil is so, so great that they'll do anything, even die, to destroy the happiness of the living. So just as, you know, in one sense, even if a terrorist mission doesn't succeed on many occasions, still it creates a scar of fear in people's mind. And, and that's success. Like, like one explosion leaves a shadow of fear that yes. goes on for maybe a whole lifetime. That's it. So that, life is never success. the same again. That is success. That is what a terrorist sacrifices himself or herself for. I, I hate so much how you are happy, Chaitanya Charanji. And I will do anything, even sacrifice my own life to make you miserable. That's a terrorist. And that is what Ravana demonstrates. And then in the beginning, the hunter also demonstrated the same thing. That just as the, the male and female crane were in the forest and they were together and they were happy, That's right. the hunter just ended their, I mean, ended their loving relationship. Similarly, right. Ravana, Ravana ended that relationship between the divine couple. That's right. And never would that female crane ever, ever, the quality of life the movements of her sweet heart would never be the same ever again. That's what this world is about, Chaitanya Charanji. It's about the impoverishment of the heart that hits, you know, affluent and poor societies the same. We, as humans, we break one another's hearts. The bhakti movement is to be the antidote to that if we're not breaking each other's hearts in the movement. The antidote to that is to move everyone's hearts. That's the way I translate movement, as you know, after today's doc. That's... I love blowing your mind, Chaitanya Charanji. <laughs> really, it's one of my per, it's, it's one of my perverse just, pleasures in life. It really is. It's not just blowing my mind; it's you could say uh, paralyzing my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and that's unusual. That's unusual, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so in one sense, uh, like you said, it's our existential predicament. That love is always tied with loss. But, yes. But 
we can say it is only bhakti that resolves that predicament by yes. linking us with a love that will ultimately never be lost that is the precisely. love for krishna precisely beautiful beautifully put and so if uh, so we could again like i talked about uh, uh, that pendulum so if we say that we expect only love in this world even in our relationship with devotees that's not going to happen that's uh, that's unrealistic because you know devotees are also a part of this world and uh, another extreme is like if we see only loss and think you know devotees may let me down or devotees may depart and so i will, we don't open our hearts then also we will we will our heart will not blossom so in one sense right. if we focus only on the love part we will be we will be jolted we will be shocked and we will be betrayed but if we focus on fear on focus only on the loss part and fear then our heart will never grow yeah so so this also brings us back to the point which is said about arjuna arjuna seeing the complexity of reality yes so for us when we relate with devotees we also have to recognize the complexity that there is both love and there is loss yes. so yeah you know there's one metaphor Uh, if i may just continue this thread of thought yes yes that uh, it's like a child when they grow child grows up like if for a baby the parents are perfect the parents are like god then the baby grows up and becomes a teenager and then the parents are like uh, prison wardens practically <laughs> <laughs> then they can see all the ways in the parents are restricting them all the faults in the parents but then as the child, as the, the teenager becomes an adult then the, they they are not blind to the faults of the parents as they were in the infancy or childhood but they are not obsessed with the faults as they were in the teenagers they have a more mature enriched understanding of their parents and they are grateful for what the parents have done for them yes so in one sense i felt that our relationship with devotees also goes through those stages like mm. when we come to the temple initially we think oh every devotee is a pure devotee yeah. and we our devotees are so loving and so kind and they are but then once we come into our teenage phase in our spiritual life yeah it's it's almost like after 10 15 years in spiritual life it's like devotees experience a i could say like a peculiar kind of turbulence mm mm-hmm. just when they think that now my spiritual life should be stabilizing that now i have practiced bhakti i have uh, gone or got over some of my basic anar- gross anarthas but a different kind of turbulence comes in and then it's later we get to a more balanced understanding that yes and then in the devotee circle i may i may have my heart broken at times but it is only in the devotee circle that ultimately my heart will be healed and i will be able to learn to love krishna yes well put well put thank you so so this loss and love we were discussing so can you now maybe elaborate a little bit on the love aspect we understand but how to process the loss in a mature way you said earlier one point that uh, that in the the person is never lost in the sense that their affection their influence right. their shape the impact in terms of shaping our heart growing our spiritual body that is always there yes uh, but even but uh, despite that the loss is also real that's so right so if we have to face what is real as arjuna did then how do how can we face that loss yeah you know part of the reason why humans find it very difficult to face loss because facing loss means to face one's heart and remember we are all here to escape from our true hearts what's in our true heart is krishna that's our true heart 
So we're all here, you know, to, to run away from our hearts. This is this is the problem. It all begins there. Krishna Bahir Mukha. Our facing away from Krishna. We're all Krishna Bahir Mukis. <laughs> you know, we're so we have to face toward Krishna. So part of the problem with grieving Chaitanya Charanji is we will tend to repress it. We'll tend to, um, um, uh, sometimes it's so overwhelming that, it, and, and it's natural that sometimes this will happen. We will become numb. And this is the emotional system shutting down. A little bit like if you have an electrical storm and the lightning hits the electrical system of a house, the circuit breaker goes on. Mm. It cuts off the circuit. So, so you won't blow all the you know, appliances and the rest of the house. Humans have circuit breakers. And at a certain point, that kind of makes sense because it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I remember when Prabhupada left. No, it was just inconceivable that we would not have Prabhupada. <laughs> he was so much a part of all of our lives. I mean, he was our life in the physical manifestation. I remember I, that was my first semester at Harvard. When Prabhupada departed, I stayed in my room next to the temple for two weeks. I didn't even attend class. I was numbed. I had to figure out how to deal with this. Now, the movement was no help in this. They were busy trying to replace Prabhupada uh, because they felt that without replacing Prabhupada, we would still be, there would be a gap or there'd be a problem. But of course we found out that doesn't work. So I was pretty much on my own with other, a few other very close devotees to process this grief. And one of the things that one can either, you know, one can either take sedatives, one can take drugs, one can drink, one can uh, uh, go on Prozac, one can, you know, um, Arjuna could have chosen those ways. I mean, either that Prozac, I'm sure there was the herbal equivalent of Prozac. <laughs> at the time, okay? Um, but he chose, like I said, 18 and a half verses. He spoke to Krishna, just reeling. He, he was just reeling in grief. And he was even a little angry toward Krishna. You know how I know? He called Krishna Madhusudana which means slayer of the demon Madhu, which is as if to say, you don't even kill people you love. You kill demons, but you don't, you're asking me to do something that you don't even do. Ouch. Oh my, oh. Beautiful, eh? Oh, you know, oh, oh. you know. Arjuna was even upset with Krishna. You know, See, you, like don't, you don't, you you what well, you're asking me to do, you're God, and you don't even do this. But I have to interrupt you here. I'm ecstatic. <laughs> Actually, mm, just I told you I had this three-part seminar on grief. Yeah. So, 
no devotees ask questions and one question that came up was that sometimes if we lose someone who is very dear to us you know we may feel angry with god we may feel betrayed by god you know that i so uh, is it sinful to have such feelings no so so you know i said no but i no. didn't really have like clear pramanas i gave the example of how when abhimanyu passed abhimanyu was killed arjuna actually lashed out at his brothers and then he turned toward krishna krishna you you must have known this was happening why didn't you tell me and similarly draupadi also when she met uh, krishna in the forest after they were exiled she said krishna i deserve your protection i was your fr- I, i'm your sakhi i'm your friend i'm your relative i'm your devotee why didn't you come to protect me so yeah. those those were two examples i gave but this is beautiful this arisud yes. this madhusudana and arisudana as yes. a two words he comes over there you kill yes. you don't kill your relatives so that i never thought of that as a expression of anger but it is yeah it is he's, he's, he's at least he's talking back to krishna yes so that is the expression of anger yes he's upset Mm. And I can give you a verse from the Rasa Panchadhyayi. Desire, anger, fear, and certainly loving attachment, intimacy, and affection should always be directed toward Hari. By doing so, or by so doing, persons became become fully absorbed. in god that's my translation of chapter 29 of the dashamaskanda 15th verse there you go beautiful you know i mean it's a wonderful praman but i would say that many devotees may feel that this is only for the gopis who are purely loving krishna for krishna's sake our love is not pure our anger maybe is because of our frustrated attachments but uh, and you know what even if that's true that means even if we have to be angry toward krishna still we are relating with krishna yes so you know i was explaining this point but i really love this example that says you know if we have to have a real relationship with krishna then a real relationship will have a whole panorama of emotions Yes. If we like legislate out some emotions. Yes. We are not having a real relationship. Of course. You could be angry. You could be angry with someone that you love. Yeah. And uh, also of course there would be a certain amount of regulation in our anger. Now when we love someone we are not going to physically assault that person if we are angry. We are not going to destroy that person. There are That's limits right. to expressing that anger. And That's those right. limits also express love. that's right that we care for but repressing the anger is not necessarily no. a question of love no so no. repressing understand. the anger is is retreating where it, it, uh, repressing the anger would be uh krishna uh i mean arjuna retreating back into the pandava army and just say i'm not going to talk about it um feeding the ego and trying to overdo it another way to suppress the grief is let me join the uh kauravas there are all kinds of ways chaitanya charanji that we humans can escape from our hearts the hari krishna movement is to move back into our hearts so you know this is amazing i love this phrase that we are, we are, that you said earlier that we are here to escape from our two hearts and there are that's so right sometimes uh, there is this you know there's this term spiritual bypassing where <laughs> yeah. where the idea is that we can use god to stay away from god that's right so, so we can say that you know i have such unshakable faith in krishna that i will never question krishna's action in my life right but in that process actually we are we are as i said retreating we are not connecting with krishna right mm-hmm. that's right amazing 
so you are saying uh, we're talking about processing loss so one way to process loss might also be uh, so you you uh, expressing anger and you said that that numbness you give the example of that numbness so that yes. was as a you you and you you give further elaborate that you were two weeks uh, you were treated so you are saying that that even that numbness that comes after uh, after a loss the shock a, the shock is also a part, part of, of the healing process is a part of the yes. well look what look what happened with arjuna what did he do at the end of the in the 46th verse of the 47 verse chapter uh, the first chapter he he fell to his knees he sat down in his chariot he collapsed if that isn't numbness, I don't know what is. He collapsed. And again, Grief yeah. makes us collapse, Chaitanya Charanji. So we have to allow ourselves to collapse. And you know what? If you have loved, you will lose. But you will gain. Wherever there is true love, there will always be loss, but there will always be miraculous gain. Can you explain that gain part? It's 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 very well um, uh, illustrated in the um, in the Christian Leela, right? The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, mm. right? The loss of Jesus hmm. uh, precipitated, and his death, and the grief, all of that precipitated the resurrection. Let's take the Ras Lila. Krishna disappeared from the Vrajagopikas in the in the uh, uh, at the end of the first chapter, the 29th chapter of the Dashamaskanda. They went crazy. They started imitating Krishna, trying to remember Krishna's movements and his behaviors. And then they started asking the large, you know, uh, uh, plant life of the forest, have you seen Krishna? They were talking to the trees. Then they started talking to the plants and they got so desperate, they got into the ground to talk to these little tiny plants that maybe they found themselves under the lotus feet of the Lord and no one responded. And then they just, of course, then they found Radha who also had been deserted, apparently. And then the Gopi Gita comes in the middle chapter, right? After following the second chapter, the Rasa Panchadayi, the Gopi Gita, and this is where they are, you know, in some sense, devastated. The loss there is fully displayed in 19 verses. And this is where they are calling out to Krishna. And they are remembering Krishna, even in his Aishwarya manifestations. Whereas when they're with Krishna, the Aishwarya is not something they relate to much at all. Arjuna also had to relate to Krishna's Aishwarya manifestation in trying to find his way back to Krishna, who is still right in front of him. Love is right in front of us, but we can't find it, just like Arjuna. He was gradually coming back to his heart. But Krishna felt the need to give him special vision to see the Aishwarya of the Virata Rupa. And that would allow him to appreciate what was actually right in front of him all the time. So that's what we have to do. We have to go through this process of collapsing in our own chariots, that our bodies. We collapse in our bodies. Then 
someone comes to us and helps us bring us back to our hearts gradually. Something, some events, some people, some whatever, some Shastra. Then we need to see the big picture, the Virata Rupa. Sometimes people will go out into nature, like the huge ocean, something much bigger than our little picture of pain. Go into the forest, go into the mountains. Humans do that naturally to get the bigger picture. Well, Krishna was right there. He could give them the bigger picture right then and there, the Virata Rupa. But that ultimately doesn't do it either. Why? Because you have to return. You can't stay in the big picture. But finally, Krishna delivered to Arjuna the secret, the greater secret, and the greatest secret of all. As you know, I like to speak about. Mm. Yes, and the yes. ultimate secret is Krishna has been embracing us through his, and without, within, and everywhere. And he's right in front of us as Bhagavan waiting for us to return the embrace. When we return the embrace of Krishna's embrace, when we return the call of Krishna's call through the Maha Mantra, then all grief is gone. It all makes sense. And all loves come together. Amazing. So we're just going back a little bit. I mean, I would yeah. love to this conclusion. This yes. Vata Rupa, this big picture. So if we consider, there is this, uh, in Sanskrit, there's the concept of smashan and vairagya. That uh -huh. the renunciation in the crematorium. Right. So sometimes uh, seeing that big picture can horrify us so much that uh, we can uh, we can just think that I just want to do nothing with the world. I don't know. That's, that could be another way of numbness. Another right. form of numbness. Yeah. Because it's not so much numbness as fearfulness. Right. But, uh, so I like that point that, you know, we have to see the big picture, but we can't live in that big picture all the time. No. Because we have our small part in the world and we have to function here. That's right. And I think this is, uh, I mean, this is also a big subject, which maybe we can discuss that yes. some other time that, you know, we, we say that we should remember death so that we can get an impetus to remember Krishna. But then, you know, constantly remembering death and being afraid of death is no way to live. Is, right. Isn't it, it can be, I remember one, devo, one devotee, Mataji, met me in Australia. And she had said that she, she saw several traumatic deaths in her early childhood. And she had developed like a paranoia of death. And she had to take a lot of psychological treatment to heal from it. And then she came to a Bhagavad Gita class where the devotee was speaking on death. Yes. And not only the death can come at any moment, but he had a like a video montage of people dying in all unexpected situations. Somebody is a shopping mall and suddenly they get a heart attack and they die. Somebody is, is uh, you know, they're just enjoying life. Maybe they're in a, a Disneyland or whatever. So she said that traumatized her so much. And her psychologist told her that, you know, don't attend such classes. It's a psychologically damaging for you. So she was asking me, you know, is hearing Bhagavad Gita psychologically damaging? Yes. So, so I explained to her that the Bhagavad Gita is not psychologically damaging, but you know some aspects of the Gita's wisdom can rub off negatively on us. So, yes. and you know, if we are already psychologically wounded in a particular way, then the 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 remembrance of death is not meant to create fearfulness in us. The remembrance of death is meant to create that conviction to connect with Krishna urgently. That's right. And if, if somebody is said influenced too much by the mode of ignorance for whatever reason, then, then thinking about death is not going to help them. It is going to create only fear in them. So That's unless right. a person has is, you could say, psychologically well-formed enough uh, to see death positively, it requires a certain level of goodness. So, yes. so, you know, so in that sense, 
uh, we can't uh, con- again i'm reinforcing that point that we can't live constantly in fear of the big pic- in the big picture and the fear of that big picture yes so but still are you saying that seeing the big picture is also a part of the healing journey yes the essential part yes i would say so yes it's part of placing our small pictures into the an acknowledgement that there is a bigger picture in which our small picture fits but we can't as you said and as i said we can't stay in the big picture but it helps put things in perspective with the small picture the small painful picture because the big picture is ultimately loving and embracing and fully absorbing but uh and especially in the liberated stage but our small pictures we have to address the elements that are moving within that smaller picture so it's about putting things in perspective mm. so you know you could say that uh that the virat rupa is a big picture and krishna's love is the biggest picture in a sense and uh, to go from our small picture to that biggest picture we need to go through that big picture that that's otherwise right. we won't get the necessary impetus that's we, right or we even if we not i would say not only impetus in one sense krishna value sorry arjuna uh, valued krishna's loving to three fold bending for more after he understood that actually that virat rupa is coming from this form precisely so in one sense after we understand the futility and mort- mortality of what worldly existence we value krishna's love more otherwise that i think that's that's in some ways a difference between like something like a cultural or ritual practice of bhakti and an actual spiritual practice of bhakti so it's a it's a you know i never thought of so much that the bhagavad gita is actually a journey oh, for healing absolutely healing from grief and loss and wounds it's a grief it's a grief narrative <sighs> amazing yeah and uh, you know see jetan charanji you never know what's going to come out of my mouth every time you talk with me so uh again that's uh, that's one of the fun things about our talks we discover these things together to that's amazing so bro can you maybe as we've talked for a long time maybe yeah. for conclusion how yes. does one practically come toward that realization that you know i am always been embraced by krishna and now it is time for me to return his embrace so uh, because when we are in the throes of grief when we are even say questioning god's existence or questioning god's benevolence to actually feel his love so one one answer i was asked this question one answer i gave is that that's why we need loving relationships yes where in although we may have lost one relationship there are other relationships through which we not only feel the love of those those individuals but we feel god's love through them yes but beautiful what, Mm, so yeah so what what all would you suggest to actually we have to do again arjuna is the perfect model he had to sit with his, as he collapsed in his chariot which is metaphorical for colla- the body collapsing rendering us frankly fairly useless for anything else we have to sit with our grief we have to feel not try to run from the pain run from the 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 loss we have to sit with it we have to hurt we have to feel the pain the further you go into the shloka the more you will get from the shloka of krishna's presence the deeper you go into the grief is a way of going more deeply into one's heart and the deeper you go into the heart the more deeply we connect with krishna 
So it's all about the shoka and, and the experience, not running from the shoka, but experiencing it, acknowledging it, not, you know, embracing it and to, and to not stop until the shloka appears, the poetry of Krishna's presence, his loving presence. That's what shoka does. It brings out the shloka of Krishna's loving presence even more in our lives. This is so it's amazing. So it's rather than thinking that if somebody is grieving, that it's not that they are ignorant and they are attached and they are lamenting as a sign of their ignorant attachment, rather than seeing it that way. So we see it in a different way that that, that actually this person who loved me and I lost this person, it is actually Krishna who was loving me through this person. Yes. And in that sense, when I go deeper, to go deeper, sit with that grief and to go deeper into that grief means to actually understand that it was Krishna's love coming through that person and then that Krishna is still there with me. That's right. Beautiful. And ultimately, such a loss will be something found, a love newly found, because the connection that we actually had with that person was something conducted by Krishna's internal potency. And then we can travel to that person's heart when they're not in their embodied form. So today, Chaitanya Charanji happens to be the anniversary of my father's departure from this world. Oh. On May 31st at 11.08, I was there and he departed this world. He stopped breathing right in front of me. And I had a wonderful relationship with my father but I still do. When the body departs, the body disintegrates, the body goes away, the love that was really there stays, and that's permanent. So you find new ways of relating to that loved one just as powerfully as when they were here. And that is why many people engage in ancestral worship, the shraddha, you know, ceremonies and so on, because the powerful presence of the departed, they depart, but they leave a part. Leave a part, okay, beautiful. When they depart, they leave a part of themselves that would, you would never be the same person. I would never be the person I am today if I did not know my father. He has left a part of himself with me that's permanent when he departed. Beautiful. So, Joe. What I'm gathering over here is that, and many things, but one thing is that sometimes when we separate worldly love and uh, spiritual love very radically as opposed to each other, we're actually uh, doing injustice to the universality of love. Yes. It, I mean, we are fragmenting ourselves. That's Ultimately, right. it is... Uh, so, you, so, but still... Uh, so you said that our, all our relationships, even if they are not directly centered on Krishna, they are conducted through the internal potency or, or we have the opportunity to experience the internal potency in all relationships, even if they are not themselves directly under the, inter, directly under the internal potency. How would you put yes. that? Well, you see, there are shades, as the Bhakti Sutra explains, there are shades of love in this world. There's still love, but it may not be as, as uh, 
prominent and as dominant as ideally we would like. So even in worldly relationships, they are unwittingly participating in a love that finds its source in the divine. That's why ultimately everyone seeks the divine because they finally realize anandamayo byasat. They realize the chlad dini potency, the chlad dini shakti. They experience a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of that as individuals. When they no longer become individuals, bhaktas become individuals. In fact, that's what bhakta means, an apportionment, a division. A individual. So as bhaktas, yeah. we are connecting ourselves to this source of love. And that is the perfection of life. We seek it whether we know it or not. It's just part of who we are. It's our nature. It's our swarupa. So rather than, so while we, we process the loss of a loved one, we, that the very intensity of that loss in one sense points us to our heart, which is made to love. And then it points us to the one who is, one whom we ultimately love. So that's how, you know, through the grief, we can move toward Krishna. Yes. No, but it, is it actually possible? I mean, maybe this is a concluding question. But for some, is it actually possible to move through grief toward Krishna uh, without expert guidance at that time? Because when when one is grieving, it just over it overwhelms the person, and we may chant, we may still chant our rounds, and we may do kirtan, we may go through the motions of bhakti, but uh, like the heart is numbed. So is it like a phase, like you said, two, two weeks was the time which you took to process. So is it something that happens with time? What can, what can a devotee who is either going through this heart-shattering loss or a devotee who is wanting to assist somebody who's gone through that loss, what can they do to ease or accelerate that journey toward healing? Of course, in our bhakti process, <clears throat> as you and I both know, the guiding, loving hand of a Vaishnava is irreplaceable. In some sense, Krishna gives us examples of the way to interact with grieving brothers and sisters. However, there, of course, is a difference. Your more like a friend reflecting something of what Krishna did for Arjuna. So you're not trying to solve their grief for them the way that Krishna does. Krishna's already solving our griefs, our various griefs, uh, by what he teaches Arjuna. But what we can do is be loving and comforting. And pointing uh, devotees in the direction uh, of encouraging them to sit with their grief, to go deep with their grief, to find the loss fully, to, to dwell in that loss. And the more they do, the more they will find. I, paradoxically, the more they will find an extraordinary deepening of the heart which is our goal. This is what we're here to do. Ramananda Roy does say, <clears throat> when Mahaprabhu asks, what is the most painful thing in this world? He said, it is the loss of a Vaishnava, the loss of a devotee, the loss of a bhakta. It is so painful. And yet, at the same time, it's so celebratory as well. It's it's one of those paradoxes. It just is so painful. 
but it's so wonderful at the same time. Full of wonder, full of pain. What does that do? It softens the heart to be able to love and contain more love than ever before. And eventually, our hearts will become so full and so abundant with love that it will burst out of this body and cause our own death. It will cause our own departure. As our hearts fill up with so much love that this body is no longer a suitable vessel to contain it. A bhakta's love is so overflowing that have you ever tried to put on a shoe that didn't fit you? It just doesn't work. Beautiful. I remember you mentioned this last time that you know, that the devotee's body is no longer enough. But in it, this context, it, it's amazing. Yeah. It's no, and that's what happens. The more we deepen the heart through our various griefs and 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 and, and, and we do the work, and we don't run from the work of the heart, then we will contain more love than we could have ever conceived. And then, of course, there is Mahaprabhu's example that he could not even maintain a body at all. And that's the example of a bhakta. He or she can no longer contain the love. And they must, uh, a death becomes a kind of bursting out from this mortal coil to something far more adequate to contain their hearts. So now, I challenge you to summarize everything. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Because okay. I have to leave in a few minutes. Yes, so, thank you. Yeah. Guys, let's. Uh, so, we discussed on the topic of love and loss uh, in our relationship with living and departed Vaishnavas. And uh, we started with uh, the, I, I said the context that you lost so many devotees. And I think the unifying thread of all we discussed was. Ar Arjuna, how the Bhagavad Gita is a grief narrative. And then also we drew several insights from the Gopi Gita. And uh, basically, Anandmayo Abhyasat, you know, we are all, our hearts are meant to love. And uh, it is a part of our very existential nature. And ultimately, we are meant to love Krishna. And while we are in this world, we uh, we basically find ways to escape from our hearts. And sometimes loss is what forces us to confront our heart. So if we consider that when we are going to love, we started with you no know, anyone we love, that wouldn't be possible without Krishna because uh, their, their lovability comes from a spark of Krishna. And they are all living, moving temples of Krishna. So some are uh, the devotees or exalted devotees are like temples where they are visibly actively temples. And those who are worldly minded, they are like deserted or desecrated temples. So we either act, build a temple when we are interacting with people or we are visiting a temple and relishing the temple. So it's a, So interacting with people in a loving way is with everyone, not just devotees, is actually a part of our our devotion, our bhakti. And then when we start with that ground vision, then we things like just like Arjuna, for him, things became complicated when he came in the middle and faced the reality of how things are. So when we want to love, for us, there is always the fear of loss. Because the person whom we love may go away or the person whom we love may not turn out to be what we had thought they were mm. because they have a dark side. And again, there is that loss. So we could live with a blinkered view where we only look at the lovable part and neglect the dark part, but that will eventually shatter us. 
or we could look at the dark part and we will think i will never love but that will also dry up our heart was so it arjuna just as arjuna confronted that complexity so we need to confront the complexity of 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 love in the world of loving the real people in the world mm. and uh, that means that uh, so so you then you talked about the grief of uh, i think two things one was the grief of we didn't process the grief of prabhupad's departure and then we got caught in the external markers of success while not growing internally so in we tried to replace prabhupad instead of actually connecting deeper with him so in acting strong when we are weak we actually become weaker and in admitting our weaknesses we can actually connect with the ultimate strength of krishna mm, so beautiful so when so similarly that that beautiful point of shloka to sh- sh- shoka to shloka mm-hmm. so the ramayana is also a, in one sense a grief narrative in which uh, from seeing the agony of that uh, crane she crane on the loss of her uh, her partner from that agony the ramayana shloka came out and just as that bird a hunter was cursed to hunter was cursed to never find a home because he had stripped the she bird of the home of her home right. so and in the bigger sense the whole ramayana narrative is reflecting the same thing that uh, ravana came and ravana like the hunter who shattered the loving relationship between the divine couple and that things never came back to the same even when rita sita was returned but through all that trauma of separation Uh, the shloka of the ramayan and the beautiful love between the divine couple came about so for all of us also we have to confront confront our shoka till the shloka till the shloka till the love will emerge and uh, uh, that means sitting down with our grief and ultimately seeing that you talk about the individual and the indivisible ultimate reality mm-hmm. so we see that this person as a in, as a person as a individual they loved me but at the same time they were also instrumental for krishna's love to come through me so when we when we when we actually process that grief that person may be lost to us but a, they depart but they leave apart so what we we'll, <laughs> <laughs> so all relationships are meant to ultimately teach us to love purely to love so the part of us that influenced us we learn to love through them and ultimately if we see that their love is coming from krishna then we actually learn to love krishna more we we learn purer love so then uh, it talked also about uh, the gita's flow where krishna Ar- uh, krishna showed the virata rupa and that is like from our small picture of pain we see the big picture that you know pain is a part of the world uh, but that doesn't satisfy the heart so just say that it's it been passive really pacify arjuna so there might be some some renunciation or sense of meaninglessness that might come temporarily when we see misery but like people may withdraw from ordinary life go to some forest or something like that to process the grief but after we go to that big picture then the, we need to come to the biggest picture we can say that is ultimately the most krishna's love for us so krishna yeah. has been embracing us always through the person who was there with us and through the person and even and even if that person is gone krishna's embrace is still there and then we also talked about this point of when we are going through this grief journey it's uh, it's important for us to find the ways like like loving guidance of our devotees by which we can actually perceive krishna's love so and uh, you talked several points about the gopi's love for krishna that uh, that you talked about three kinds of re- not just three kinds of love but three kinds of relationship with love that's a nice point mm-hmm. and then there when we are processing our grief there might be even anger toward god and krishna is krishna is ready to accept that krishna doesn't see that as a sign of faithlessness He talked about the gopi saying that uh, even anger in the gopi gita that uh, in the rapadas panchad there that even anger should be directed toward the lord so so that means that 
if we feel let down if we feel angry that also we accept and we we move through that that's true and then then uh, toward the end you also mentioned about your you know, your father's uh, departure and how it's still you know the part of him lives with you so when we we don't we don't see ourselves as if somebody is grieving it's not that we solve their grief problem rather it is krishna who will solve that grief problem and we can act as pointers or assistants in helping them move toward krishna mm-hmm. and when we do that that's how we actually they grow and we also grow through that so ultimately rather than uh, say separating love separating love into say mundane or or say sacred in terms of with the devotees or separating love in terms of love with devotees and love for krishna we see that it's all connected that yes. there can be higher and higher levels of purity that we come to but uh, if we see that ultimately ev- all of existence is ultimately meant to through love and through loss it is meant to take us toward krishna mm. then we can act so bhakti you, yeah, that's two three points that you made about bhakti is right bhakti is like working on the heart it's the movement so movement is actually meant to move our hearts ultimately toward krishna move our heart towards each other in love and towards krishna mm. so if we are really going to be bhaktas then we don't run away from the work of the heart and grief sometimes forces us to do that work of the heart and yes. just as arjuna voluntarily came forward to confront the reality of the situation similarly we can also come forward and we emerge till we and we move ahead till the last point was you know, for a devotee the body is too little a vehicle to contain the love that they want to offer and that's how they get elevated to a spiritual body so prove that is amazing uh, uh, journey Perfect. thank you very much this is inspiring and i i'm sure that this will really enrich many many devotees in this discussion and just uh, thank you so much for your time prabhu well thank you for yours and wonderful connecting with you chaitanya charanji and i'm happy to serve your heart and anyone else's heart that's what we're here to do amazing prabhu thank you look Hare forward to your association again in the future we'll do i also thank you thank you prabhu krishna